cafe. Um, we're excited to, to get a large group. Uh, we've done a lot of overviews of IFTDIS in the past, but we continue to release functionality and want to make sure that people are up to speed on what the current system can do. And honestly, uh, we used to be able to do this in 30 minutes, but now um, it can do quite a bit. So I would just um, buckle up. Uh, this will be somewhat speedy um, and high level, uh, but you can put questions in the chat box um, if you want additional detail or have a question about something specific that I bring up. So what we'll cover is what uh, can I do in IFTDIS today um, and what was just released. I will cover that. Um, and then uh, Kim is going to cover um, application examples of what's currently released. And then uh, Nicole will go into the what's coming next and the specifics of uh, where we're going um, with some of the quantitative wildfire risk assessment work. Just for some background, uh, the IFTDIS application, the current version was launched in spring of 2017, rather. We've got over 2,000 user accounts and um, roughly 70% government and 30% um, private, and there's, there's a lot of variation um, within that, that private. Um, and you can sort of see the split in this pie chart, but quite a bit of uh, non-government use uh, private sector contractors as well as um, academic folks. As far as uh, usage of the application in terms of um, since the release, how's it been going? This, this chart is hot off the press, just kind of showing um, since the release in April of 2017. Um, you know, sort of the, the ups and downs, and then what we're hoping is a bit of a trend toward an increase. Maybe things to point out here. We've highlighted the versions um, and what each version contained. There may be some seasonality with when is a fuel treatment planning kind of time of year versus fire season. Um, of particular note, I guess, is we released uh, landscape burn probability um, back in March. That's represented by the the orange in these stacked charts. So um, there's just been some steady use of that since its release. Um, the others are just uh, various metrics of use with reports and, and model runs and that sort of thing. So just if people are wondering about trends in usage. So what scales does IFTDIS address? This is an important factor and question we get frequently. Our current maximum um, landscape size that a user can request is three and a half million acres. Uh, it's really pulling close to a five million acre landscape at that point because we're automatically buffering the landscape uh, to allow for the um, firm probability model to read information outside of your um, landscape uh, boundary. Um, it's really intended more for the project or unit level scale, which generally coincides with acreages such as those. This graphic just shows, you know, there's there's risk assessments, for example, done at the national and regional scale. And, and if this is really um, intended for use more at the unit or project scale, um, and even in the risk scenario, you know, as you hone in and get finer scale data and specific data, the results may, may vary a little bit um, with some things. So what can if you just do now, I've broken it into four primary categories, um, just easy to digest stuff. So number one, I could do a lot of cool, easy map stuff, which is helpful for fire folks without a GIS background. Uh, secondly, model fire behavior across large landscapes. Generate a lot of summary reports um, that can be exported into documents if necessary, as well as a download export function for use in external things like ArcGIS. Um, and we've got a functionality to both develop and compare different treatment scenarios for fuels planning. So to dive into those just a little bit deeper, um, the cool easy map stuff, uh, within the application there's a, a large set of uh, reference data. You know, this is all <coughs> web-based and these data layers are primarily uh, pointing to data services at this point. So we have the most current versions that are um, approved uh, out there and they update automatically you know at the data service level uh, most of the layers are uh, of the layers contained in WFDIS are available as well as 
uh, additional ones that we thought of use for fuels treatment planning, so fuel, fire history, uh, fuels treatments, et cetera. Um, and once these, with these reference layers, users can create um, shape files within the application from the reference data uh, if they don't have that data themselves. Uh, and those can be used for area of interest uh, for various reports and analyses. Um, in addition to the reference data, if that doesn't meet the needs of the user, there's the ability to upload um, and save shape files. Uh, you can see the upload functionality on the right hand of the screen here. It can bring in quite a bit of attribution. Um, users can save it and add it to the map. And then this, this My Layers thing that's circled. So when a user accesses the data within the application, it differentiates between the reference layers for the application and then their own layers that they have uploaded. There's also some editing uh, that you can do within the application of those layers, but it's not a fully functional GIS, and there's some querying and the ability to create subsets, that sort of thing. The other big thing is the ability to um, both generate and edit uh, landscapes using land fire data. Um, just showing what the interface looks like, there's a create a landscape and then a landscape edit. Um, we did just add in a recent release what is currently available for Landfire 2016. Um, within the application, it will just tell you whether or not you can successfully get 2016, and it's, it's everything within the purple polygon here on the right. So wherever that data is complete and available, um, we've got it loaded in there. And when a user generates a landscape, it can be done either through uh, just drawing a simple square in a draw mode, or there's also um, a functionality where you can say, um, use my area of interest and draw a square around it. So say if you have a, a park or a district boundary and you want a landscape for your whole district, instead of you know kind of holding your mouth crooked and trying to draw the square just right, you can just pick area of interest, uh, draw me a landscape around it. Um, and then you'll immediately get uh, the landscape with all the layers within it. Um, there's the query functionality to see um, at the pixel level or to generate reports of what's within that landscape. Quite easy process. The editing landscape functionality is, um, in my opinion, uh, fairly user friendly compared to other applications where landscape edits can happen. Are you getting some feedback, Kim? Yeah, yes, you are echoing just a little bit, not sure. Okay, is that better now? Um, yeah, and I'm gonna. Okay. If anyone pops in, I'm gonna have to keep track on some muting here. So, go ahead. I okay. Think you're good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so there's a couple reasons, as you folks know, why you might edit the landscape. Number one is that the land fire data is is just incorrect, um, and you need to make corrections to uh, rectify that data for your specific area. Um, and the other reason is you may want to edit the landscape to simulate various treatment alternatives. So within IFTDIS, we have uh, the ability to do um, do those types of edits. There's two types of rule sets that you can use. One is called a user created user created edit rule, which is more of a traditional rule uh, where you can select a landscape attribute and manually prescribe changes. Uh, this can be done at the pixel level or at a at a polygon level at an area of interest level. Um, and then the second one is this. Um, land fire disturbance or fuels treatment disturbance edit rule. This is unique to IFTDIS. We worked with the land fire team um, to utilize what they had uh, developed for their disturbance edit rules over the years as they did various updates to land fire between <clears throat> releases. Um, and we captured that into a, a large uh, suite of sort of lookup tables and associated that with treatment types um, and then time since treatment or disturbance. So there's four primary categories, um, thinning with flash remove, thinning with flash remain, clear cut, wildland fire, and then a sort of severity class. And, and these should not be looked at as prescriptive, like the silviculturist had a certain um, you know, prescription for thinning density, trees break, or that sort of thing. This is pretty broad brush, high level, but it's, it's based on existing vegetation types. So it it's a lot easier than trying to manually edit each pixel to represent the changes in both surface and canopy fuels. 
And then you can select this time since disturbance, apply it to an area of interest or a mask on your landscape, um, and create a new landscape. So some pretty robust functionality that, um, and then users can compare those landscapes and see um, if the treatment edits that they made make sense. And these treatment edits are good not only for planning scenarios where you're gaming out different treatments, but also uh, traditionally the land fire data has been uh, behind. So if you know of those wildfires or treatments that have occurred on your landscape, you can use them to update your landscape. So pretty big functionality built into these these edit rules. And I will say that these these um, edit rules are not yet available for the land fire 2016 remap data that we just got in um, because of the the way they did the remap. Um, the tables that we built won't work and there's going to be a need to be a new set uh, derived and we're, we're hoping some people will embrace that as a project to work on because these rules seem fairly popular and can be used um, by other applications besides FPDIS. So the next thing beyond the cool easy map stuff is modeling fire behavior across large landscapes. I already mentioned that uh, three and a half million acres is roughly um, the maximum size. There's a variety of different um, fire behavior modeling that can be done. I've listed here first what we call the auto 97th or user-defined inputs. Um, then we have uh, FLAMMAT basic or landscape fire behavior as it's called in IFTDIS, which is fire behavior at the pixel level. Landscape burn probability model built within the application. Uh, within that, you can generate integrated hazard maps resulting from that uh, burn probability model, and then overlay values at risk. And I'll show some examples of each of these. Um, within the application, this is primarily done from, it's called the playground, or using this model fire behavior card. So the first thing I mentioned, and we built this to be just a quick and dirty for a new user to see what the application can do, is you can generate uh, fire behavior, um, what we call the auto 97th level, which is pulling the uh, 97th percentile weather associated with um, associated with the 97th percentile ERC for the nearest ROS station to the center of the landscape that that's got a certain duration of data um, and is vetted for quality control. It's the same weather stations used in WOFDIS, um, and then it's pretty transparent. You can see um, once you run this what those values were. So it's intended as a starting point. What's, you know, let me do a quick run. Here's what a run looks like under these um, fuel moisture conditions and, and wind conditions. And then I can just manually edit those and, and rerun it um, to get what I think is potentially more appropriate than that initial automated run. When you do run um, flat map basic or landscape fire behavior, um, again, I said it's at the pixel level. You can run a large landscape. This is all of Eastern Massachusetts. Um, You'll automatically um, get a display on the map. Uh, you can choose your different outputs to look at. In this case, this is looking at flame length across this entire landscape at the pixel level. Uh, in the right-hand panel, you've got a description of, of your run. For example, what uh, crown fire method you use, whether or not you use gridded winds, what your input values were, whether uh, fuel moisture conditioning happened, et cetera. So a quick and dirty look at this landscape for fly map basic. Uh, in addition to that model, and I'm just showing in the modeling playground that currently there's a pick list of two, so you can run that landscape fire behavior at the pixel level, or you can run landscape burn probability. This is the same area using the landscape burn probability model within IFTDIS. Um, so your output and your legend is going to be a representation of burn probability, and it's important to note the way we chose to display this. So it takes the uh, maximum burn probability of the analysis for this specific area, which is actually shown in parentheses, although the value may be less meaningful. And then uh, this is scaled off of that maximum. So anything in red is um, a value of 80 to 100% of that maximum value, and so on down to classes below that. So it's not an even distribution. It's all in relation to the maximum. And this maximum is based on this particular landscape. So the point being that you cannot run this model in different areas on different landscapes and compare the results. Each one is unique and scaled to the area that you're analyzing at the time. 
And again, you've got your right-hand panel information describing what you've run. Just to talk a little bit more in depth, and Nicole can describe this in depth if people have questions, but the what we're using for the burn probability model within IFTDIS is uh, based on the flam map five. So the scenario we're looking at is a problem fire analysis. It needs to be a worst case uh, scenario in terms of fire behavior and fuel moistures. And it's looking at that single uh, weather scenario, the single scenario of the input values. They're not um, changing over time and it's not uh, looking at different fire seasons. This is one specific set of inputs. You actually specify the duration of the burning period. Um, we currently are using randomized ignitions across the landscape. Won't steal Nicole's thunder about uh, the changes we're going to be making to ignition potential. Um, so that's how this burn probability model differs from, say, FSIM, which is looking across the full fire season, um, and FS Pro, which is really looking more for uh, suppression strategy development um, based on one fire and many weather scenarios. So little primer there on what we've got. And this is pulled directly from uh, GTR 315 from um, Joe Scott's publication on risk. So a little bit more depth on what you get when you run a landscape burn probability analysis within if you this, um, you'll get three spatial outputs. One is the burn probability that I already talked about. Uh, the second you can toggle on is the conditional flame length, um, which is the an estimate of the average flame length for all the fires that burn at a given point on the landscape. Um, so this can be toggled on and off as well. And then thirdly, um, we've created something called integrated hazard, which is a derived value or if it is based on the burn probability class and the flame length class that also rates from lowest to highest. Um, so it's a single characteristic that can be mapped that takes both of these factors into account. So continuing with the uh, looking at fire behavior across large landscapes, we released in December um, something called map values. We decided when we were developing quantitative risk assessment analysis that we would release it in pieces uh, rather than waiting for the whole shebang to be ready because it's fairly extensive um, to build. So the first piece that we released is, is called map values or um, map highly valued resources and HVRAs. And the way that works is the user moves into a, a split screen mode and we based a lot of this on the work that's already been done in risk analyses. So the user will select a burn probability output or landscape some geographic extent, um, and then they'll begin the process of designating primary HVRA categories and then identifying the sub HVRAs that fall within those categories. We've got a pick list um, of the most commonly used primary HVRA categories from the national assessment and a a sample of regional risk assessments um, as a starting point, although users can create their own primary category. Uh, and then all of the reference data within the application, both the um, reference data that comes with IFTDIS as well as the national reference data used in the national risk mapping, as well as the users uh, uploaded shapefiles are, are available as sub HVRAs to put into these primary HVRA categories. So basically, the user picks a category. It's a pick list of either their own data or some reference data, oops, and begins populating um, a set of HVRAs that will be saved as an HVRA set within the application. So currently, this, uh, without the actual um, quantitative risk assessment or the exposure assessment release, this is, serves as a bit of like a, a bookmark for your map to be able to um, retrieve all your HVRA sets pretty easily. Um, and the other thing that you can do it is, is at this point you can swipe or just overlay your burn probability with the HVRA sets and, and get a visual evaluation of say how the burn probability overlays with in this case, I think this is um, population density. So where does my highest burn probability sit in relation to my population density just by swiping those overlays of the HVRA sets in the landscape burn probability on the map. 
I've mentioned a couple times that if this uh, generates a lot of summary reports and has download export functionality, I just want to show a couple examples of that. Um, one, I talked about the Auto 97th report. That's very quick and easy without um, many steps at all. A user can pick a landscape, pick an area of interest or not, and request a report. Um, and they'll get a message that they've got a hyperlink available uh, to access that report. When they open that report, it'll open in a new tab uh, on the application. And like I said, it's, it's pretty transparent. It's going to tell you the name of the weather station. Um, if there was, um, you know, tell you the observation information, if, if conditioning was used, it'd tell you, and then you can see what the auto 97th values that it pulled from that station are. So if you don't like them, you just do it again without them. And then these reports on the left, this is just an interactive dialogue where you can pick a landscape characteristic or a model output characteristic and, and immediately jump to it within this on-screen report. Um, and then each output section has a, a download for either the image or the, um, the full thing can be downloaded as a PDF. And, and you'll get a, a map, a bar chart, a pie chart table for every landscape parameter and for every model output. These reports can be requested at any time from what's called the user's workspace. It's sort of like a in Windows Explorer, you know, where your, your stuff is stored, you can organize it by folder, and then you can request a report for the, a variety of things, including landscapes and, and model outputs within the application. It's just some examples of, uh, like I said, if you download a full PDF, you would get a title page. Um, and then some pie charts and bar charts, for example, fuel model data or rate of spread output data, just to show what they look like. So each one of these could be captured with a little snip for a PNG to put in a report. In addition to this on, online report on screen, uh, user can download um, data. So within that same menu in the workspace, um, in addition to request a report, there's a download button. And that just allows users to download um, a zip file of the uh, multi-band uh, geotiffs. Um, so you can do this with your original and or your edited landscapes. You can do it with outputs um, to be used in other applications or to pull into a GIS for further analysis. Here's an example of the, the things that come with it in a download for uh, one of the fire behavior model outputs. The last thing I want to mention is uh, the develop and compare treatment alternative scenarios. So that's within um, the strategic planning portion of the BFD DIS cycle. Um, it's called develop treatment alternatives. And this is a sort of a, a built as a tabular approach to go through the process of um, firstly, getting your landscape. Um, Secondly, editing your landscape to both correct any errors in it and then to game out different treatment scenarios. You run, um, you establish the model input values to, to run the model. In this case, this is only available currently for um, um, flat map basic or the landscape fire behavior. Run the model and then compare alternatives. So it's sort of a left to right um, scenario. And what that looks like, again, in the editing phase of the landscape, you've You've just got a split screen mode, but the same landscape editing uh, options are available as if you're just editing a landscape to correct it. You've got the treatment types or um, a user defined rule set. So in this case, this example, this is showing just some uh, proposed prescribed fire units um, on a landscape. I'm doing some edits to represent what would happen if we burned that the prescribed fire in those, those areas. And then once it gets to the compare section, when you've done your inputs and, and edits and, and run the model, you have the alternatives you develop listed. And then you, you can only pair two at a time at this point. You, you pick two to compare. The zero represents your original or um, your originating landscape. And then you can compare it either in a summary report or you can compare it on a map. Um, if you compare it on the map, you get these different grids of, for example, uh, outputs, flame length, rate of spread. You can toggle on and off all the different grids. Um, if you use the identify tool, it would show you the uh, the original flame length 
and then the, the, the flame length for each landscape that's listed, basically. Um, and when you request to compare it in a summary report, you'll, you can look at either a landscape compare summary report, which is going to show you just what those landscape edits look like um, in terms of your fuel models, your canopy cover, et cetera, or you can compare the actual fire behavior from those edits in a comparison report. I think I have an example, just a simple example for this one. Um, if you chose to focus on just flame length, um, you've got the both treatments represented. In this case, the, the green represents the untreated landscape, and then the blue represents the treated landscape one year post prescribed fire. These are flame length classes along the x axis. So you can see that um, as a result of the proposed treatment, the model has shifted um, things that were in the original landscape here in green, the high flame length classes have been shifted into lower flame length classes. So if that's one of your objectives, then you can affirm in a modeling sense that yes, um, the model says that the, those landscape changes would result in the decreased fire behavior. So that's a quick overview of the developed treatment alternatives. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention, I'm not going to go into detail about it, but in addition to all the um, things that I just described in terms of functionality, IFTDIS is also uh, the place where fuel treatment effectiveness monitoring occurs, uh, which is a requirement for all the federal agencies. It's it's the same login as uh, IFTDIS, and then within IFTDIS there's FTEM. You go back and forth, and it's a um, it's basically the the spatial um, version of the old uh, FTEM, which was more of a database version, and it's pulling the wildfire data directly from uh, GeoMac and Irwin and the fuel data from the authoritative sources of FACTS and NIFPORS. That'll actually be changing soon to um, to the National Perimeter Incident Feature Service. Um, and then it's a role-based access. Um, so there's different controls that happen um, within the agencies on who can view data versus who can edit data versus who's an administrator, et cetera. But I think most folks that use that are familiar with the system. So that's my high-level overview of the application. I was going to turn it over to, to Kim to talk about how people actually are applying the tool um, in their everyday work. Can you Great. take it, Kim, or should I give it to yeah, you? Yeah, I'll take I think I, either way, here I can grab it. i got to shuffle a couple okay. of screens around. Okay. Um, all right, I'm going to go ahead and grab this. All right, here we go. Hopefully I'm sharing the right screen. Let me make myself a present. All right, let me know if I should. I need to pop up. Oops, there we go. Should be saying the what is this is being used for screen. Hopefully it'll, there we go. Yep, you got it. Everyone seeing that? Okay, great. And you guys can hear me okay? All right, so I'm just gonna run through a few examples here. We've got um, uh, quite a number of users. You've got about uh, just over 2,000 accounts in the system now. So. We're starting to learn about how different people are using IFTDIS and they're kind of in their day job. So um, I wanted to just run through a couple of examples um, and give you an idea of how it's being used. And we're always looking to hear from folks about how you are using IFTDIS. So if you've got an interesting um, example and, or maybe you're just starting starting out using IFTDIS and um, you know want to know if other people are doing similar things, just you know pop us an email or whatever. And we can point you to other folks that might be doing the same thing you're trying to do. And uh, we just we do really like to hear kind of how the system is being utilized. So um, these are some examples we've gotten from some of our users over over time. And uh, you know everything from NEPA specialist reports to writing prescribed fire plans. Um, we've had people use them at uh, with for CWPPs, the wildfire protection plans. Um, and then the beginning stages of some of the risk assessment, even though we don't have the whole thing built yet. Um, like Caroline was showing with the burn probability and the integrated hazard, uh, we've got folks that are starting to utilize those outputs in, in some reports and some meetings and things. So, um, yeah, there's quite a quite a variety. So let me uh, let me go to the next screen here, and uh, I've got a, a few examples I'll run through. Um, Monique from the Colville National Forest, she detailed with us last uh, fall and into the winter time. And um, she was actually doing a little project 
on the forest to look at um, incorporating some of the, uh, with the new forest plan that they had just had approved, um, trying to demonstrate some need uh, of field treatments on different parts of the forest. So in this case, it was one of the districts looking at, um, you know, a need to, they had some private land and tribal land nearby and, and the whole idea to reduce, you know, fuel loading and overall um, continuity of fuels next to these private lands and, ad and adjacent communities. So she she walked through a scenario of using IFTDIS and that that treatment alternative um, workflow that Caroline just showed you, and uh, and it came up with a really nice example that she's been sharing with her district um, ID team. And from that, actually, I'm going to slide this over here. I just want to show everybody um, if I can. Oops. Oh, I need to get out of present mode. Um, Monique was able to put together a uh, a tutorial for us and uh, based on her work. So this is a PDF of that tutorial, I'm just sort of slowly scrolling, scrolling through kind of how she put it together. And we've got some other tutorials that are similar to this, um, but she put this together so somebody could actually walk through learning how to use that developing treatment alternative uh, workflow in IFIDIS. So we're gonna post this to uh, the online help center and a great way for someone who's just getting started to, to see a real example and uh, how that was done on the ground. So that's something we're excited to have in there. And again, like I said, there's a few other examples um, in our help system, and I'll show you that here um, just at the end. So that's one from uh, the Colville. And then we've got another one, Dan Offman down on the Shasta Trinity um, had been working on some NEPA analyses and looking at some proposed actions and was using IFIDIS to uh, to game out some uh, some different fuels treatments after having to go in and make some some significant changes to the land fire data based on um, based on burn severity and things that were disturbance that had happened uh, post 2014 uh, since that was the last land fire layer um, that we had and until we just recently released the 2016 data so. Um, I think Dan was finding that it was a real uh, easy, useful way to go in and really critique his landscapes before trying to game out some of these alternatives for this uh, NEPA work he was doing. Uh, Jasper Peach, down in the um, Park Service there in Yosemite, has been using if you just for burn plan writing. And um, I'm actually in the process of working with Jennifer Anderson, who's actually, I think, on the call today. Thanks, Jen. Um, we're putting together a little module on the new wildfire learning portal on how to use IFIDIS to inform a prescribed fire plan. And um, so that's something that if you guys haven't seen the new wildland fire portal yet, I'll show you some images of it later, but um, we want to show some folks that uh, there's lots of pieces of IFIDIS that can be exported into a, into a burn plan. So we're going to, we're going to show everybody how to do that in a uh, kind of a walkthrough um, online course, so that'll be coming. But Jasper's been doing that and has shared some of his results with us on how that's been working for him. Uh, Lisa Saberstein up in Alaska has been using IFIDIS for some uh, more of the risk work. And this is looking at some of the communities that are adjacent to the refuge system up there that she you know, is very familiar with. And um, trying to game some things out and look at burn probability uh, relative to to those communities and um, trying to use that for some PR work and some information sharing with those communities to help to help get some firewise um, plans in place and uh, looking at uh, using fuel breaks and such. So that's one of the things that she's been focusing on up there in Alaska. She's got a few other projects she's been doing too. And I know it's pretty excited about getting some of the new risk assessment tools in her hands. Um, she's been a, a SDS user for quite a while. so been a great test case for us to see how it's evolved for her over the years. Uh, Chris Boldman, who is, um, he's a district FMO uh, here in Idaho on the Idaho City District. He's currently detailed to the regional office for Region 4, and he has been working very closely with Boise County and the Boise National Forest to uh, start some of this collaborative process and the beginning stages of that quantitative risk assessment work, you know, identifying values, um, he was really interested in bringing some of the rural fire districts along in Boise County um, that have maybe traditionally been a little bit um, hesitant to get involved in some of these um, forest level planning type things. So by working with the county and developing some of these outputs uh, specifically for the county, it's been really useful for him to share those 
results at the county level and then bring some of those partners along. And then he's also going to be, um, as we develop more for the um, risk part through the through the next several months, uh, adapting that to some of the forest um, uses, they're also revising their forest plan and uh, are hoping to use some of these outputs to inform some of that planning. So that's just sort of a smattering of examples out in the field. There's a bunch more out there, but um, I think it's always nice to, to see kind of how people are actually using the system. And I wanted to share one example, again, thanks to Jennifer Anderson down in Florida. Jennifer's the fire planner for National Forest in Florida and has been working with us on our user advisory group. And she came up with this nice little uh, case study just of how she was using this and showing the forest folks how if you just can be used to help prioritize some fuels treatments. So I stole this from, from Jennifer, and I'm just going to walk through a quick example of, uh, of kind of how she's applied this on the landscape. So Apalachicola National Forest in uh, the Panhandle of Florida, We're looking at the western side of the forest. And uh, this is broken into you know many burn units. The Appalachia burns you know, upwards of 100,000 acres on any given good burn year. And part of what they were dealing with was uh, some of the damage from Hurricane Michael that was uh, a, a few years ago. And uh, kind of the aftermath of, of that hurricane damage and how it's impacted the western half of the forest. And as we know, our, you know, there's a lot of RCWs, there's other values, especially along that forest boundary that uh, has caused some change in thought on, on how to prioritize the different um, burn units rather than sticking with their normal a schedule of you know burning on a three or five year rotation. So some of the hurricane damage um, has caused some some rethinking of maybe we should prioritize a little differently. So um, walking through this example with with Jen here, um, the west side's broken into these these burn units, and you can see the colors orange were tr units treated in 2018, uh, the purple um, treated last year 2019, and then the hatched units are kind of what's proposed going into 2020. So the thought was, well, here we have on the western side of the forest, there's been um, some additional disturbance that we've never, we haven't had to count account for before. So let's use IFTDIS to see if we can't um, tease out some some data to pick and choose these burn units if we can't burn them all. So she walked through our strategic planning part of IFTDIS and walking through the burn probability model, and then adding the values. The mapping values piece in order to to take a look at this. And of course, this is done before um, the stuff that uh, Nicole's going to present, which is coming very soon. And I'm at, this will end sort of as uh, Nicole picks up what's coming next, and then Jennifer would be able to go back and continue with this example with some of the new parts of IFTDIS that are coming along. So this is uh, the landscape uh, pulled from Landfire and looking at that disturbance again in the western uh, side of the forest boundary. And you can see in the purple on the landscape here where uh, there's been some editing, obviously, of the fuels based on some serious change in forest structure based on that hurricane. Um, so you can see kind of what they're dealing with there on the Appalach and other parts of the panhandle, of course. So we have our landscape, and then uh, Jennifer wanted to run the burn probability model. So these are the inputs she selected uh, based on you know, her knowledge of the local area, looking at that worst case scenario and, uh, and identifying fuel moistures and, and burn periods, et cetera. And Carolyn walked you through this just a little bit. And then getting the outputs for that burn probability and uh, basically the left side burn probability with the uh, burn units on top of that that conditional flame length output, and then the integrated hazard output here on the right. And you can, just by looking at these alone and looking at those burn unit boundaries, you can start to get an idea of, and this is stuff you might know intuitively, but this gives you a way to sit down with resource advisors and other folks that might not have the picture of the map in their mind and, uh, and really show them what these outputs and how they match up with some of the things you know, everybody has their favorite pixel. So where, you know, where do I really care about as a biologist or a, a, a maybe a hydrologist or something like that? So you can see how she's taken these results and then you can um, tailor them down to that area of interest. So when you produce the reports, you're pr producing the reports just on those polygons and not on the entire landscape. So that's what this screen capture is showing is, uh, is using that area of interest locked into those burn units um, to get those report results. 
And this is what one of the reports would look like from that. This is based on that conditional flame length and how it's broken out <clears throat> across those different burn units. And certainly you could then, you could go even further if you wanted to, um, you know, break it down by, by, by burn unit. But the idea with this was to look at the thing across the whole spectrum of, of treatment units that, that exist and then start prioritizing um, along those treatment units. So the next step for Jennifer was then to put those values on the map and, uh, and then use that as another discussion piece to then tease out picking and choosing if we have limited money and time, which of those uh, burn units should we focus on? So this was the, uh, the HVRA set that Jen produced. And then you can see here in the last box under HVRA wildlife, we've got some RCWs and some teeny species that were local data that Jen uploaded in order to identify those HVRAs in a local sense. And the rest came from our um, national data set. And just really quick, a quick digression. I just wanted to show you a snapshot of our health center. A lot of folks have asked us about the reference data that we're using for the map values and the HVRAs. So we've got a, some extensive uh, help and, and documentation in the in the if you just help system in order to if you're really curious about where some of this data came from you can click on these links and lead a, read about the metadata and 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 where these data sets were derived and then how we're how we're displaying them in if you just. so there's quite a bit and you can see here on the left side of the menu for the help center there's a lot of um, information available if you want to dig into additional information um, for any parts of, of the if this system, it's all broken down into these nice drop-down menus so you can find what you're looking for. There's also a search bar at the top so you can type in any any terminology you want or any anything that you're trying to find within the health system and that search search system is, is pretty thorough. It'll, it'll pull up the data you're looking for. So back to our example, once we add those HBRAs on top of the, um, of the burn probability, in this case, it's the integrated hazard, um output here on the right side and then the values here on the left side you can see we've got the rcw trees which we all know and love from the uh, southern region are you know definitely things that help us pick and choose where we do our work and um so those are the the purple circles here on the map and then some of the other values um that J jen identified as well so once you couple those with that integrated hazard map you kind of have a a manual version of our exposure analysis and that's what Nicole's going to talk about here next but I wanted to show you how that looks on the map and then easily picking out some of these burn units down here on the bottom and then the values as you move up to the top and uh, where that high integrated hazard is as it as it matches up with those RCWs and some of the other values to say hey this is this, this might not be the end all of your decision making for this, but it certainly is an informative piece when you're sitting down with, with your fire folks and your budget folks to, uh, to say, hey, where, where, should we, where should we put our money and our time this year, given um, you know, this new hazard we have based on that hurricane damage and some of the values and things we care about. So that's just sort of a, a little example um, case study of, of one way to apply uh, the parts we have in IFTDIS to date. And um, I think what we want to do now is take you to what's coming next and then how we could go back to some of these examples and add in additional analyses as we uh, continue to release parts of the system, both coming up very soon in, in March and then through the summer into the fall. So I think it's time to turn it over to Nicole and uh, let her talk about what's next. Thanks, Kim. And do the same of moving things over, yeah. <laughs> bringing them in yeah. to present. So hopefully, gotcha. I should be on the right. And if anyone has right slide now, yeah. If anyone has questions, go ahead and throw any questions you have into our little chat box on the GoTo meeting, and um, we'll we'll try to answer you right right away. Or if it's something we can get back to you if it's a longer type of question and answer. <laughs> All right. All right. So. Um, um, yeah, so this is kind of what's coming next, and then some of the next is very soon. Some of the next is just starting development. We're making decisions on it, so a little longer time frame than that. But um, Caroline alluded to it a little bit earlier when she was talking about the landscape burn probability model. Um, we're going to add one little enhancement to uh, the input that you can do when you run that model specifically, so the landscape burn probability model that it is. Initially, we 
controlled the number of missions that um, were used for each run. And we did that to just optimize modeling time, computing power, et cetera. Um, but we realized a lot of people want to do true comparisons. So really comparing apples to apples instead of apples to oranges by always having random ignition. So we're going to add the functionality or ability to reuse an ignition file from a run you did earlier in Ifedis. So at that point, you can hold those static um, if you choose to do that. So that's just one slight enhancement we're doing. It's kind of just to help you really do sensitivity analyses if you're learning about the model, um, to look at true comparisons if you're changing landscapes to show treatments, or um, and it'll be really important as we move forward with exposure and risk. So this will be coming out um, early March, along with exposure. So also, as Ben mentioned, um, we've been slowly releasing parts to doing a, risk, a full quantitative wildfire risk assessment as kind of a four-step process. And we've talked about simulating wildfire, which is that landscape or probability model. Caroline and Kim both touched on the map values, so being able to actually map your highly valued resources and assets across the landscape. And then the next two components are exposure and risk. So exposure is what we're developing now. It's almost done, and that will be released in early March. So um, we're, we're excited for that to, to come out and be available. Um, quick and dirty, basically what an exposure analysis is, is it characterizes your fire behavior where your um, sub HVRIs are present. So it's it's really the burn probability, conditional flame length, or integrated hazard where your values exist. Um, it's great to highlight areas of high exposure for fuel treatment planning, um, and also to see if treatments that you're proposing or different alternatives meet your objectives as far as reducing exposure is concerned or hazard. Um, what we'll be doing in the application is in order to do this, like we said, it's building blocks. So you'll have to run your landscape or probability model um, in our playground. And then you'll also have to create an HVRI set with those map values that Caroline and Kim both showed. So those are the two components together to be able to run your exposure analysis. So it is kind of building upon each other as we release each of these phases um, within FDD. So this is the interface where you would run the exposure. Um, once it's run and completed, uh, you would be able to download it just like everything else we have in FDDIS. So that would be um, a GeoTIFF version. So you can bring it into ArcMap if you so choose and you want to summarize your data in a different way. You have the power of doing that. And it gives you the components from the landscape and probability model you want that characterize the, the hazard as well as rastered, rastered versions of the sub HVRA's presence or absence. So you can get that data from the system to to do what you want with it. Um, this is just an example of what the hazard or the, the um, exposure analysis looks like in our Map Studio interface. You can use our identity tool to see you know, what your values are, burn probability and whatnot at a given point and what sub HVRAs exist at that one point in the landscape if you wanted to drill down and just see what's stacked on top of each other and one place that in Map Studio as with most things in FDDIS, you can request a report as well. And this is just an example of a report. So I should have said I stuck with the Apatikola National Forest for this, um, just to stay with the trend and make Jen be the, the woman of the hour with a lot of the work she's done with us to help us out. Um, this here shows the side panel that you'd have in a report. So it's all the components that are getting summarized when you do an exposure report. And then for each part, we have map templates. So for example, this is looking at the recreation primary HVRA and then the sub HVRA that were assigned in my map values for um, that, that area specifically. So we give bar charts to tell you the mean values of the bar probability, conditional flame length, integrated hazard. We also have relative extent and expected area burn. And these are all things that are included within um, the GTR 315. So it's we're trying to follow that the best we can to give examples and information to users that they can do. And you would get this type of a look for all the different um, primary HVRAs. We also give you large summary statistics tables and stuff that you can take that elsewhere and do other charting if you, if you choose. And then once we're done with exposure, we will start actively doing the development for risk. So kind of the last step in doing um, risk assessments for IFDIS. And again, just like everything else, it's building upon each other. 
So we would use the landscape firm probability component that we've released our map values. But the additional steps that you need to do a risk assessment is you need to define your response functions and your relative importance. So um, within IFDDIS, we will have the ability for users to define their own response functions. So we're basically the first to quick second order fire effects that uh, characterize fire effects based on flame length intensities. Um, I just want to say for the national HBRA set that we showed you, the ones that were used for the, the national risk assessment, we will supply those response function values that came with that data. However, a user could change or edit um, those values if they don't meet exactly what they, they want. We're still playing with how this is going to look and feel in this, but this is just one of the mock-ups we've been working with with IBM to um, try and just get the look and feel for how data would be entered for doing risk assessments. Um, so this is just a screenshot of entering those response functions where a user can type them in as they work along and there's interactive charts to help them kind of get a sense of what, um, what they're typing and how that applies to different flame length intensities. Um, the other component that is needed is the relative importance. Um, and that's really needed where there are the multiple HVRAs to just prioritize them in a way or weight them against each other to based on how important they are or not to the analysis at hand. Um, typically, the response functions, which I should have said as well, and the relative importance are done in workshop settings. So we're going to give tools within our training and help system to kind of guide users to be able to do that on their own. We won't be holding workshops ourselves, but we're going to try and give them as many handouts and tools to kind of get them working along in the right direction to be able to assign good response functions and relative importance to um, complete their, their analyses. And again, this is a screenshot of what we're thinking as far as the interface with, um, within IFTDIS to enter those values. So we're, we're playing with different formats and layouts where the users would have to type in once they've had their workshop, they would come to the system and type in their values to do the risk assessment. Um, once, once they've done, brought in their data, they'll be able to run the risk assessment. And it's similar to the other um, outputs we have in IFTDIS. There's always a mapped value. And you'll have to squint, because this looks exactly like Florida. Um, but we don't have example maps quite yet for that study area, for the Apalachicola. But we will be using or creating a couple maps, most likely the conditional net value change and the expected net value change maps that are common amongst a lot of the risk assessments. This is directly from the Pacific Northwest QRA documentation. Um, so these are two of the, the maps that are frequent with these risk assessments, and we feel that would also be beneficial for users in IFDIS, as well as we haven't figured out all the details, but we are going to do some sort of charts and statistics and other numbers for um, that summarize the map data based on the HVRAs that you've chosen and other metrics that we're still, we're still ha hammering out the details on that. Um, after risk, which I don't know if I know exactly how long risk will take, my guess is three to six months. Um, once that is done and available, this is kind of our, our wish list of what's coming next. They're not in any certain order, but um, as we get closer to Starting to implement it, we will kind of refine this list and figure out exactly what we're doing. But we know we want to do an enhanced comparison dashboard. So that would include the new ability to compare exposure, risk, landscape, burn probability, model outputs, et cetera, stuff we don't have in the system right now, um, as well as adding the ability to compare fire model outputs based on changes to weather, which we don't have. Um, we've started incorporating the MTT, minimum travel time fire spread model within. If it is, and we'd like to finish that up, so we'd be adding another model to the system, which would then also have mapped outputs and reports. Um, we've gotten asked quite frequently from users about collaboration and sharing data across different users within the system. So we will start looking at that, and we think it's going to be even more important as we start working through risk, because a lot of times you may want to share those uh, HBRA sets or mapped values across um, different users. There's also FTIM enhancements. Some of them are starting right now to get out the door, um, and they'll continue in tandem with risk development. And kind of after that, it's a good, big, we're not sure. <laughs> but we know there's so much that we can do and add into IFTDIS. It's 
just a matter of time and keeping keeping at it and keeping functionality um, building. So with that, Kim, do you want to take it back or do you want me to just advance the slide? Yeah, I can. No, I, it's okay. I can grab it back real quick. I want. Thanks, Nicole, for okay. doing uh, that yeah. overview of the future here. Um, some of this is coming soon, like uh, Nicole mentioned, and um, we will keep folks surprised of when stuff is going to get uh, released. And, um, and 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 let you know via probably via mail it seems to be the best way to do that. So, but the other thing I want to show you real quick. Um, hopefully you will see the Ifty this home screen here in just a second. And I uh, just wanted to point a couple things out on the on the website here. Um, we constantly keep this page updated. So as new things come out, you'll always be able to um, access um, any links on this page to get new information. Um, so, for example, with the new uh, remap for land fire, uh, we've got we've got the information here on on that, and we're also continuing with phasing in this risk assessment um, block. It's, anything new that comes along, we will add to here. This will this will stay on the on the homepage because that's what we're going to be working on for the next while. So, as that exposure analysis comes out, we'll get that link uh, um, made live, and it'll link to some information you can share with other folks or link to the help system. Um, Josh Hyde, who is with us on the call today, too, he is um, kind of in charge of our uh, user support system and manages the help system and the ticket system we have for ifty -DIS. Josh works for the University of Idaho and has um, a long history with us with ifty -DIS and is quite knowledgeable about um, stuff that's coming as well as, uh, you know, what we've got in the system currently. So, um, if you're sending in tickets or asking questions, chances are either um, myself or Josh will be answering some of that. But he's done a phenomenal job putting together our help system, including um, a number of videos and other um, other tutorials and things that are available. So, as part of that, I wanted to do a quick uh, a quick show me of our of our user support system. If you go up here to the user support link. Um, you can get to our help center, which is um, like I said, pretty exhaustive as far as is finding uh, information about the system and, and different pieces on how to do it. You can see there's, um, as that comes up here, tutorials. Um, there's a video link. Um, we have links to our webinars. We've got um, quite a few recorded webinars now. This one will be one of them. We'll have that posted um, in the webinar uh, section. And we also have a user forum where we are always looking for people to provide us feedback and um, and thoughts either on things they're doing in Nifty Disk or on ideas that they have. And I'll show you that in a second. But you can see here in the drop down menus on the left, if you have any questions about um, using the system, um, you can just open these different drop down tabs. Um, here's one on landscapes. This is the piece on modeling um, on our different models. As we add new models, those will be included here. Um, how we set things up with our planning cycle, and then um, just using shape files, how to how to upload and download and and get those out of the system and use them for other things. Um, same thing with our modeling output. Um, if you want to put that stuff into ArcMap and and uh, and use those things outside of Disk, there's a lot of information in this help system. Um, there's also a bunch of information here on FTEM if that's something that you're uh, learning about or um, or getting started with or need to share with folks that work for you. So for um, for example, our, our if you this webinar section, if you click on that link, that'll take you to both the scheduled webinars and the recorded webinars. We did one on landscape, um, landscape uh, burn probability modeling um, in the fall. And this is where the new uh, recording that we're doing today will be posted. Um, also, again, in the user support tab up here at the top is the support forum section. And that goes to our forum where we can um, both answer questions back and forth. You can converse with other users within the forum. We've got a question and answers forum um, that kind of goes into what's currently in the system. And then an ideas exchange if you have ideas. And hey, wouldn't it be cool if, if you this could do X, Y, or Z in the future? So feel free to um, pop into these forums and, and give us some thoughts. We, we do, like I said, really like to hear from folks. Um, so I think that's pretty much it. We wanted to uh, give a, a little bit of a few minutes for questions. We've hit the top of the hour. Um, we haven't really had any folks typing any questions into our chat box, and we've got about 30 folks on the call. So um, if anyone has a, a oh, actually, it looks like Rick has a question in here. Um, 
And his question is, has the IFTDIS team considered the ability to ingest local, state, or regional assessments? So risk assessments that have been done at, at different scales. Um, and then adding those in, looking at viewing those outputs in the IFTDIS, I'm guessing, Rick, and then um, viewing that those areas of interest and then being able to compare. And we, we have talked about it. We don't have um, the, the ArcGIS Online part of the system set up to, to bring that stuff in yet, but it's certainly um, a question we get, we have gotten asked, and there are so many different risk assessments out there that um, getting folks to understand the differences between them and how they can be used at different scales does seem to be a kind of an important thing as we move forward with this. So I don't know, Nicole, do you want to comment on that at all as far as bringing in other risk assessment outputs? Yeah, I think you covered it. It's just for right now we want to focus on developing the functionality in IFTDS, and then we'll go back and take more time to look at those and bring them in maybe as reference data or seeing how they could be used within the system. Yeah, that's a it's a great point. Thanks for bringing that up. And people have also up asked us if they can upload their own landscapes. For example, if there's a landscape you've altered and in you know and done your your tweaks to and gotten your local information into, can you up then upload that LCP file into IFTDIS to use that? And the answer to that currently is no, but we do know that that's something folks are interested in and uh, sort of on our list for future development to allow some of those raster type files to uh, be used in the system um, for various things. So whether it's just for viewing or actual analysis. So it is on the list and uh, we do know people work hard on getting their landscapes, you know, situated so they're, so they're usable. Um, so if you have ideas like that and thoughts, please send them our way. We do want to hear those things. and. And we've we've actually been able to do some updates to the system uh, based on user feedback. So uh, Landfire 2016 was a big one, even though it's not fully released for the entire CONUS yet. Um, we knew folks wanted to start using that, so we we've gotten that into the system. Um, there's some other things like that that people have requested that we've been able to make some changes. So if you have thoughts and ideas, please send them our way. And uh, the more we hear from the squeaky wheels, in in this case, actually sometimes do get the uh, get the development. So <laughs> so let, definitely let us know. All right. Well, I don't see any other questions in here. And like I said, we really do appreciate you guys joining us. We're going to post this uh, recording to the website. And um, as soon as I have the link available, I've got an email list, um, I think, with, with most folks that have attended. We'll get the, that, that link out to both um, Rick Stratton, who I know shared um, with an extensive email list, as did Frankie Romero and some other folks. So. We want to get that link out. If um, you want to share that with other people who weren't able to make it today, we'd, we'd love that. That's great. And um, let us know your thoughts on the system and uh, keep us posted on how you're using it. Uh, we really like to hear those, those case studies. So we hope everybody has a really great weekend too. It's Friday afternoon and uh, it's five o'clock somewhere, I think, right? Yes, it so is. So everyone have, have a, uh, especially on the East Coast, <laughs> right, Caroline? <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining, and we'll uh, make sure we're in contact. All right. Oh, someone just asked, when will uh, Monique's um, tutorial be posted? It'll be posted in the help system under that um, under that tutorials link. So uh, take a look for that, and we'll get that out um, probably in the next week or so. All right. Have a great day, everybody. Happy Friday.